So this talk, just as a quick overview, this is not a developer talk. So if you're looking for actual like encryption algorithms and things like that, this is not the talk for you. This is a very introduction, uh, very low-level introduction to encrypting your own stuff, to encrypt your data, practical use of it. So I just want to get that out there before we get started. If that's if you're thinking it's something else. If you are looking for the slides, there's a lot of resources I put up in the slides. It's on the first page, or you can find it at uh, wieg.co and wcorl17. So that's, uh, if, like I said, there's a lot of links, a lot of things like that. These slides are already online if, you, if you're looking for any of those resources later. And as we talk about encryption and that, I'll give you a little background on who I am and why I feel I'm qualified to talk about this. I'm a developer for UF Health currently. I've worked for 10up, I've worked for, I've taught computer science at the university level. There's a plugin out there called iThemes Security that I had built when it was better WP security and then sold it back to iThemes. And I've talked about this particular talk I've given in London and other countries. Uh, I've uh, given a whole lot of security talks over the years from this camp to other various word camps. I've generally been in the WordPress security space for about Oh, seven years now since I got involved with WordPress. Before that, I was an airline pilot. I've been a musician. I've been a lot of other things. So while well, I've gone through a lot of different hats, this type of encryption and security, and that's kind of actually followed me through careers for quite a few years now. My first day as a professional pilot was 9-11, which might have been a, a, a sign right there on getting involved with it. And as we do get involved with security, the first thing we need to talk about then is, is our threat models with different things, whether it be flying, or in this case, whether it be your WordPress site, whether it be your client sites and things like that. And your threat model is simply the, applica the application of security to your own personal life. It's the level of exposure to various threats and other dangers that you have personally. So one person, a, a developer's threat model might be very different than somebody whose job it is to print uh, business cards or some sort of print purse or uh, role. It's very different than a project manager's role. If you work in something like healthcare, I work for Shands Hospitals up at UF. Our threat model is very different than somebody whose site is a single person blog, like maybe a, a mommy blog or something other than that. So the threat model is very specific to what you're doing, and that's something that we need to keep in mind through all this. And in order to assess your own threat model, if this is something that you haven't thought of before, questions such as what data do you have? Where do you have this data? And who gave you this data? Especially in the last one, who gave the data to you becomes really important as we're talking about dealing with our clients. And that's really important because if the computer is used to communicate with others, the data given to you must be included as part of your threat model, which is what a lot of most people miss. When I ask somebody, do you run antivirus on your computer? Do you run uh, this on your computer? Do you run that? What, you know, what do you do to lock down your computer? Most people tell me, I don't have anything on there I care about. Well, do you email your customers? Do you email your clients? Do you have a, maybe even the list of emails of clients that have, you know, contact form? You have a blog, you get 100 visitors a month, but they all have to email you for a question. Now you've collected all their email addresses and data that they trust you with. So these are the types of data that you have to think about a little bit differently with WordPress than most people when I ask about their phone. Do you have a VPN on your phone? No, I, I only use it for Facebook or something. Well, what about everybody else that you contact on Facebook? Well, I only use it for Twitter. What about other people with Twitter? I only use it to text my spouse, whatever it might be. Well, their phone number is in your phone. There was a really interesting article just this last week on how Facebook makes connections, on how it, uh, you know, and this, this is just very high level, but it's uh, how Facebook makes connections between people. And you know, there's all the rumors out that, you know, I was talking, uh, walking down the street talking about buying something with a friend, and two weeks later, Facebook was showing me ads. They're not listening to everything. That would take a heck, you can imagine what your, ba your battery life's bad enough now. You imagine if they were trying to real time process all your speech. It's not so much that. You're getting into graph theory and a lot of advanced math and how they're doing this, but the bulk of it is every time you give an uh, app permission to your contacts, you've just told that app everybody you know. Whether it's your email address from when you were a student 15 years ago or something else, if somebody still has that in your contact book, how often do you clean out your contacts? All of that information gets aggregated over time, and this type of thing becomes, it becomes part of your threat model. Now extend that to your clients and things like that, and that's where we start to have, to, we can real quickly build trust issues. And that's where this stuff gets important. 
Like I said before, we're going to talk a lot of tools in this type of talk. There's a lot of ways to do this. This is no, by no means the tools I give you are every tool out there. I have 45 minutes. We couldn't cover this all in 45 minutes, correct? But also, you might not need all these tools, and that's just fine. It's not an all or nothing thing. Every single step you implement in security is one step closer, is one less thing that people can get to you through. So whether you turn on, you, know, you, you delete the Facebook app because you don't need people knowing your location, depending on what you might be. Maybe that's one less thing that can get you in trouble. There's, the list goes on, but every step you take is a step in the right direction. So don't think that every tool I list here is, you know, well, I don't encrypt my email. That's fine. Maybe you don't really even use email and work. That's not a big deal. Just don't, so don't take this away thinking this is something you have to implement every step on. Also, so when we get started in this, the, the other difference I want to make is the difference between security versus privacy. Like I said, I, I built a, a big security plugin for WordPress. I've been talking about security, how to stop hackers from your site. This is not that talk. This talk is more about security and privacy as something, as two very different things. Security is the confidentiality, the availability, and the integrity of your data. If your website goes down, there goes the integrity of your website. There goes your data. There goes the availability. That is security when your site gets hacked. Your data is unavailable. The data is breached. Maybe that data gets out to somebody it's not supposed to be. Privacy, on the other hand, is simply the appropriate use of data. We tend to think of security on our WordPress sites and privacy as simply the first equation. We're worried about who's going to hack our sites. There's dozens of plugins out there. Make sure your site doesn't get hacked or if your site gets hacked, we'll clean it up for you. Rarely ever do we worry about the privacy of the data we may collect as, as a business person or as a blogger or as anybody just simply running the site that we're, we're working with. Those are two very different items. Whether or not you're worried about your own website or the data you have on it uh, to your users, you owe it to your users to encrypt and use things like encryption and that for both the site and the related tools. You're protecting the privacy of your users at that point. And that's really where this becomes important. So again, this isn't about you so much. This isn't about, well, I have this app on my phone. Can somebody tell where I am? Maybe that's fine. Maybe nobody, maybe you don't really, you know, if you check in on uh, Foursquare or Swarm, that might be part of a threat map. Maybe you don't need clients knowing where you're at type of thing. You know, you, when you talk about uh, high-level corporate, corporate stuff, you often don't say where you're going. When I flew business jets, we were often weren't allowed to talk about the location we're going, because for competitors, they don't need to know your location, that type of thing. That might not apply at all for this type of thing. But if your user data is on that phone and, and you're getting it out with, you know, you're allowing LinkedIn to view all your contacts. If you're allowing Foursquare to download your address book. You know, find your friends in your address book is one of the more dangerous features that we can put on some of these phones if you think about it. Because if they're going into your contact book or they're looking at your email or they're do whatever they're doing to grab those email addresses can get very dangerous very quickly for your user's privacy. Not their security. Nobody's going to go in and hack their site based on you gave them their email address. It's about their privacy at that point. What did they trust you to take to do with that email address. They trusted you to call, to call them back. They trusted you for a business contact. They trusted you for whatever it might be. They didn't, allow, you know, they didn't expect to be spammed from 50 different LinkedIn emails now that, well, your friends on LinkedIn, now, make, you know, now share this with them, share that with them, or whatever network it might be. So the privacy versus security, this is two very different aspects. The types of encryption we're going to talk about are really going to protect more of their privacy than they're going to do uh, the true security of your site. Why encryption? When we're talking about data and data privacy, encryption will go away, a little bit of a ways to do both. It'll protect both the privacy and security in certain aspects. It's not going to stop your site getting hacked, but it can stop people from getting to that data. Encryption ensures that data cannot be intercepted, modified, or otherwise tampered with. So encryption protects data both in transit and storage. So when it's sitting on your hard drive, when it's sitting on your phone, or when I'm sending that data between two people, we often think of, you know, let's put HTTPS on our site. Well, we're going to protect things that way. We're going to protect our customers' data as they send it to us. Well, what happens when it gets, when it's sitting in that email app on your phone? What happens when it's sitting in that database on your web server or some other place. So encryption can protect that data in both places. And it does this using a key 
or a set of keys without which the data cannot be accessed. Encryption ensures data can be both written and read appropriately. Encryption methods always have a way to decrypt as well as to encrypt plain text data. And the reason I say that is this isn't the same as when we save a password in WordPress. You know, when, if you ever look at your database, they've got this long, it looks like it's encrypted password. That's not encryption. That's what they call a hash. It's one way. You, can, you can't go back into your WordPress database and pull out your user's passwords, even as the site admin. That's a very one-way thing. This is two ways, and the idea here is, yes, we want to protect this data, but we also may have to get to it ourselves eventually, and that leads to some limits. It's also it, encryption. First of all, it's not user management. It doesn't care who the user is. If I have the key, I can get in. If I give somebody in this room a key to my house, you can get in my house. The house doesn't care who you are. You have the key. The same goes with encryption with our data. It's also not policy. If I say you're not allowed to share, you know, if I give you a phone from, you know, if you work with me and I give you an office phone or an office computer and I say, you're not allowed to do X on this office computer, that's policy. Encryption doesn't care if you put it on or not. How many of us have had work computers that are like, well, I really need this app, I'll install it anyway. Encryption is not gonna stop that either. This is, we're not talking about policy. That's a completely different type of thing. This is a mechanism to enforce that type of policy. We want your data encrypted or safe on your hard drive. That's the policy. So how do we do that? We use encryption to make sure that it is stored safely on the hard drive. It's not a firewall either. It neither analyzes nor blocks users. Those with the keys can get to it. It doesn't look at what the key is. If, the key, if it's the right key, you're in. Just like a car, just like a house. This isn't a firewall that says, well, that looks like a, you know, we've all seen WordFence and Security and all the fancy graphs that they put up for these sites that says, we've blocked 26 users from insert X country here overseas. Encryption doesn't do that. It doesn't care who the user is. As long as that key is available, they can get into it. So that's what encryption is, and there's a couple different types of it that when we deal with this type of thing. And the first thing is what we call symmetric encryption, which is simply applying a password to your data. We've all done this with uh, things like Word documents, Google Docs, pages, whatever word processor you use. If you put a password on it, you put a password on a zip file, you're encrypting that zip file, and it's what they call symmetric encryption. You have a password. The password that you use to save the data is the same password you use to retrieve the data. Very simple. You know, whether it's the word pass, you know, this is where we get into, they start things like one password and last pass, start talking about really, use really long passwords. Use, you know, there's all the best practices around passwords because this one word or one key is the same for everything. Password managers such as 1Password, your devices use this type of encryption. If you know, your iPhones or your Androids, your computer uses this type of encryption. Many online services use this type of encryption for various uh, storage of data. And they say, a note at the bottom, well, encrypted data might be accessed with a password. Passwords themselves in WordPress are never encrypted. Instead, they are hashed. I mentioned that earlier. So what a password by default, the password itself is not the encryption. It's simply the key to the encryption. There's ways you can password protect your WordPress database if you really got fancy with this stuff. So then that user's key would unlock the database itself, but the password itself is never gonna be encrypted. It's always, you, you don't ever want anybody to know what it is. How many people use the same password on every site they go to? That could get really bad if you could go into your admin and you have a registered user and you get their password out. Now you've completely destroyed their trust in you. Their privacy is gone. So passwords are never retrievable. That's what they call a hash. So it's a little bit different as I talk about symmetric key, which is the mechanism of using the password. It's not the password itself. Does that make sense? Then there's another type of encryption, which is practically stronger, mathematically, all these types of encryption, you know, if, if this was a math class, we could go into a lot of details on how one side can be better than the other in various circumstances and all this and that. But for practicality in most people's use, there's something called asymmetric encryption, which is what they call public key crypt cryptography. Really what this means is you have two different passwords, one to encrypt and one to decrypt. So if I wanted to send you a message, I would use my password to send it. And then you would have my public password, which only that password could decrypt it. The two passwords have to be used together. 
there's one major advantage of this. It's still passwords, and if anybody know, you know, if your password gets out, it can still be broken. But now, in most cases, you can verify that I sent you the data. Because if the two passwords only work together, there's a private key and a public key. You know, I have my private password that never gets shared, and I actually have, if you went to my Facebook account today, you could get my public password. I list it on my Facebook account. With that public password, you could encrypt something that only I could open, and I could encrypt something that anybody could open, but you could guarantee came from me. And with, if we exchange these each way, where well, I had a public key from someone else and you had my public key, you could then encrypt something only I could open, and vice versa. So now we can guarantee that not only is that transmission secure, as long as, of course, the password wasn't compromised, but now we can also guarantee that the person who claims to have sent it actually sent it to you. Which in this type of thing, when messages can be modified, messages can be altered, messages can be intercepted, it becomes a much more practically safe application of passwords. We're using, just simply using two different passwords to allow for verification. It's a pretty simple process with most of the apps for these things. You generate what they call a key pair, put your public key wherever, private key you keep safe just like your normal password. Anything that's sent to the public can be verified. Anything sent to me can be secret. So as long as you both have a key pair, you can make everything both verifiable and secret fairly quickly. And like I say, for two-way communications, we each generate one of these key pairs. There's a number of apps on Mac that do this. Apple's iMessage, Signal, a lot of these apps that you use on your phone that talk about secure communications, this is how they're actually implementing it, is with these key pairs instead of a single password. You might act, have to enter your password to unlock the key pair, but the encryption itself, the communications itself, when it's between two people, this is how they're doing it. So not just a standard password, they're actually using two passwords to make this work for you. So that's the basics of encryption in a nutshell. And the important thing here, of course, is using it. There's a lot of ways we can use it, and of course this is a WordPress talk, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is using encryption on your website, and this is what we do when we put an HTTPS or SSL certificate on there. The type of encryption, we're, we're dealing with things called TLS encryption and other things. And the idea here is protect users while they use your site. The idea of putting an SSL certificate on your site is nothing to do with securing the site itself. This isn't going to stop malware. This isn't going to stop somebody from hacking your site. It has nothing at all to do with the security of the site. It has everything to do with the security of the user. If you have a medical blog, a, a condition, let it be, maybe it's alcoholism, what, whatever it might be, and somebody's sitting in Starbucks, you owe it to that person that not everybody in Starbucks knows what they're browsing. That's the type of privacy we're dealing with here with SSL. We're not worried so much about, you know, if they send a contact form with their email address and everything, and they're sending it from Starbucks or the library or the Wi-Fi here, you owe it to that user to make sure that their data is not intercepted on its way out to you. So the idea of this type of uh, security, this type of encryption here, is strictly to protect your user's data or your user's privacy as they're co contacting you, as they're getting in touch with you as they're browsing your site. It's real easy to do. Most hosts probably have one button these, well, a lot of hosts do have one button these days. In fact, if you're using Google Chrome, now it warns you if people don't have SSL on their sites. To some extent, it seems like even on our own sites at work, a lot of sites, we don't see that warning too often, but more browsers are starting to warn that it, the site's not secure, especially if there's a form element. But things like Let's Encrypt, you can get a free certificate if you know how to install it. Places like Namecheap or your host itself can often do these for very cheap. Sometimes they want to charge you a little bit of money. I can't speak for each host, but the idea is, is it's actually free to implement depending on what their policies are behind it. Now, when you, if you were to go to Namecheap or you went to, you know, you Google SSL certificate, they might try to sell you the $150 certificate. This goes back to verification. The difference between a free certificate and a $150 certificate in almost all cases is simply that that $150 certificate, when you sign up for it, they want your driver's license. They might want your business papers to prove who you are. Whatever it might be, they're trying to prove who you are, and that's where you get the green bar. So if you're a bank, that might be a really good thing. But for just about any other WordPress site, just getting the free certificate 
has all the same security and privacy benefits as that full as that hundred and fifty dollar. Again, the only difference there is proving who you are to those users and that nothing was intercepted in between. So that's a good one for your computer. Now, of course, the computer is a small part of our websites. We have to work on the websites from somewhere, and that's from our own computers in most cases, or our work computers, or whatever it might be. On our computers, it's really, th the first thing we want to deal with is storing that data. When you shut it off, the computer's stolen out of your bag, whatever it might be. And these are so simple nowadays. Linux is a little bit different, but for Mac or for Windows, it's as simple as turning on a Mac in your system settings, just turning on file, file vault. One setting, one button, done. Everything's encrypted. And it's actually pretty strong encryption. Windows, it's not much more difficult. Uh, most new computers system about, start, enter encryption, and you turn on BitLocker in Windows. Say so various distributions of Linux, if that's your thing, have different ways of doing this. But for these main two, this is really all you need to encrypt your entire hard drive. In years past, you know, 10 years ago, I used to hear people that, well, it really slows my computer down. You won't notice the difference anymore, especially with SSD drives and all the fancier new technology. There's almost no reason at all not to have this turned on. With the exception of you lose your password, you're not getting your data back. It can cost thousands, for, you know, like the whole FBI, Apple types of things. You can pay to have people break this stuff, but it, you're paying a lot of money. This is really pretty strong encryption here to store your files. Mobile devices are just as easy. On iOS, just turn on data protection. It'll say right at the bottom of your touch, touch ID and passcode. Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, you actually, you actually have to turn on the erase data setting if you get the thing, uh, if they put your password in too, wrong too many times. On Android, it's usually under security settings. Different Android versions have this slightly differently as well, so I can't really give a definitive on every Android this is going to be the same thing. But in your settings, you can turn on this encryption just as easily. Both sets of phones have it. Apple's has been good enough that we've seen stories between Apple and the FBI trying to break this encryption. That's exactly what they're trying to get around. One note on your iOS devices, this is, might be true on your Apple computers. I don't know if there's a Windows computer out yet with Touch ID, but some countries you can often be forced to give up your fingerprint. So if you're traveling with this type of security and you rely, or you're traveling, you rely on this security, use your password, reset your phone, turn your phone off and on so it requires a password. Almost nowhere are you required to give up your password. In many places you will be, or you can be required to give up your fingerprint. So that's a very practical application when, when you're trying to keep this types of data safe. Whoa, hello. Sorry about that. Where's my mouse? Yeah, yeah, trying to. Ah! I was just raving about this touch bar, but now I don't have the play, bar, play button anymore. Ah, okay, there we go. I'll put the title back later, but. <laughs> the other side of this too is of course, always set a strong password. I say in order to make this really work on Apple, on iOS, you have the button that erase the data if it gets wrong, if you get it wrong 10 times. If you, have, if you don't have that on and you have a four digit password, it's rather trivial to just keep going through these passwords. In fact, with the uh, San Bernardino case, my understanding of how they finally broke this is they simply made a copy of the device itself and just kept trying passwords over and over and over and over until they got it. If yours is a four different digit password, that's fairly trivial. If you have a long password, the alphanumeric passwords, this becomes infinitely more or exponentially more difficult for people to break. And in all but a government agency, it's going to become very impractical for somebody to try to get through that type of encryption. So make sure you're using a strong password instead of just a simple PIN. Uh, when you, on iOS, when you select your password, it gives you, right underneath where you enter the password, it says password options, and they have alphanumeric choice. On the phone, on the phone itself. Okay. And I haven't... Mm -hmm reset my phone in a while, so I can't tell you exact the wording on it, but both Android and uh, iOS both have that when you enter your PIN or your password to change that and make sure that's a long password. Now, of course, that's going to keep the data uh, safe in storage. Where a lot of people get themselves in trouble with these types of devices these days is actually public internet. The internet here is not encrypted. 
the internet at a Starbucks in most cases, the internet or whatever your coffee shop, whatever your poison. When you're working in public, oftentimes the internet you're using is not encrypted. What I mean by that is I can sit there, uh, Firefox was a good example of this a couple years ago, there was an extension called FireSheep, where I could sit there and pull right out of the air passwords of anything you want. If you were on Facebook, I could sit there with a Firefox extension, your Facebook login would show up, I could click it and I'd be you. Everything goes out completely open. So anything that wants to listen to that data, whether it be your router or something else, can grab it. Or there's things like this pineapple. When I was here two years ago, I actually saw somebody with one of these in their bag. We didn't, I don't know if we ever caught them or not, but somebody had one of these pineapple devices with them. This is a $99 device, and it does nothing but it would mimic the name of the network and intercept everything that goes through it. The best way around this is use a VPN. You know, if, you're, if you travel internationally, people tell you use a VPN so you can get Netflix and all over the world. Nice side benefit. But the real benefit of using a VPN <laughs> software is, besides pirating TV, the uh, real benefit is it will protect, it, it basically wraps your Wi-Fi connection in, a, in an encrypted tunnel to protect it from prying eyes in public Wi-Fi. For iOS, for Mac, for Windows, for everything, the one I recommend right now is encrypt.me. For, I think, three bucks a month for five gigs or 10 bucks a month for unlimited, it completely wraps, it, it, it doesn't just completely wrap, but it's completely transparent. Every network it doesn't know, it simply turns the VPN on. It's not necessarily for the privacy of your data. So if you're doing, you know, a lot of people like the idea of a VPN to keep their browsing anonymous. Encrypt.me is not the best one for this type of thing because they do keep logs for 16 days, I believe it is. But for the security and for the type of thing we're talking about here for legitimate business purposes, it's by far the easiest thing to use. And it's on almost every platform now. If you want something a little more private, you, you know, you're getting into the whole uh, evil government conspiracies with internet and all that stuff, things like Tunnel Bear or TorGuard are really good. They're, they take it another level and simply, you have to turn it on and off every time you want to use it with those services. So it's a lot more, you know, it's easy to forget. However, they don't keep logs and that type of thing. So it's just slightly different than what's going on elsewhere. And that, that, what, what that VPN is doing is simply protecting you in a coffee shop. It's protecting your connection in public. It doesn't, now then there's other things that we can still get ourselves in trouble with and then things like encrypted messaging. If you're a journalist, if you're a blogger that's covering something controversial or something other than that, the communications between the source of your story becomes more of an, uh, a factor. And there's a few clients out there to make encryption really easy. Signal being probably the best of them out there. Signal even just launched a desktop app. Signal is a very secure, everything's stored, you know, it's using the public key encryption, it's storing everything encrypted, it's sending everything encrypted, it can mask your phone number, the whole game very easily on any of your devices, including your computers. If you don't want to play with Signal, there's WhatsApp is actually encrypted in transit, as well as iMessage even. So if you're an Apple user and the message is blue, that's actually a very secure message. If it's green, not so much. You know, any Apple users, we know the difference between the blue and the green. Green means they're not an Apple user. So standard text messaging is not secure. iMessage, however, is secure. So if you know somebody else is using Apple, and you're worried about this type of thing, make sure they're sending it to you with iMessage on. There's, there's a very practical reason to use iMessage on Apple, and that's simply to make sure those messages are secure between two iMessage users. Allo is also secure, but it does require opt-in, so you actually have to, in other words, you have to just go in and check its settings. I haven't used it since it first came out, and I know that's changed a little bit since, but if you, if you Google's Allo service, you can turn on encryption for the messages. And like I say, any of these, depending on who you're dealing with or who you're talking to, you can mix and match these types of services in order to connect to the right person is really what this comes down to. If you have certain really secure files, you know, not, we're not just talking now about storing things on your computer. We're talking about uh, mm -hmm. maybe you have a single spreadsheet with social security numbers. I used to work for a flight school and we had to keep full scans of people's passports along with all their very uh, sensitive data stored for FAA purposes, particularly after 9-11. And there's various things out there right now that you can take that initial uh, encryption service with and really make it a lot stronger. The first one being LastPass or followed up next by last or one password. 
Either one of those, so if you're using them as a password manager, you can also throw a file in there and keep it extra secure. Really, why would you want to do this? Because if you have a single, you know, if you're hard drive, if you're using your computer, your hard drive's unlocked. So anybody who's, you know, if I walk away from this computer and you want to come up and go through my data, there's nothing to stop that. I've already unlocked the computer itself. So this allows me to place an extra lock, basically, on a single file or a folder or just a small group of data that is extra important to me. One password and LastPass are by far the easiest two. There's also VeraCrypt and a newer one called Keybase. Keybase is almost a cross between a social network, a Dropbox, and a file encryption service kind of rolled all into one. It's neat. I've been using it for a while, but I can't say I've ever sent a message to or from someone with it. It's more novelty. So take that as you will, but it is, a, it is an available service for you. Of course, our most, you know, that's messaging, that's files that were sent, but of course, most people are doing this with email anyway. The best way to encrypt your email is a, right now is a service called ProtonMail. So not using your Gmail account, not using your Works email account, this ProtonMail offers full encryption. And most importantly, when we're talking about the privacy of email encryption, because email is always going through servers. There's no such thing as a direct, direct, one-to-one one -one email service, in, well, unless you're running your own server. These are non-US servers. I, last I looked, I believe it was Switzerland that these were out of. So foreign policy, privacy laws apply. Much more secure than Gmail. You know, Gmail, they go in there and they, well, they, they're telling you now they're not going to scan them for ads anymore. Take that as you will. But Gmail historically actually does scan your email for ads. So do a number of other services. This uses full encryption. It uses public key encryption to send and receive your email. Everything's stored. And again, they're stored outside of the US, so they're not subject to US uh, privacy laws. The downside of this, it's either browser-based, like Gmail, or it requires their app. So if you use Outlook or Mail.app or whatever else, you, you have, you'd have to change your workflow in order to use this particular one. But it's the easiest. Sign up for an account, I think it's 30 bucks a year, and you're good to go. If you want to do this on your own, you use something called PGP, or, which is a self-generated or an S-MIME, and you generate these certificates yourself. They allow you to encrypt or just sign, sign by signing a message. Remember I said uh, two-way communications, these, these public private keys can be used for verification. So I can simply attach the, the public key, not to encrypt it, but just to verify it. If I ever send anybody in this room an email, you probably have a weird ASC attachment for me. That's, that's my signature. That's a, that's a cryptogra cryptographic signature that I send with all my email in order to verify. So I'm just using it for the verify thing in most places. Once you have that signature, though, it's also my public key. You can use it to encrypt messages back to me. In eight, nine, give or take, maybe 10 years or more of using PGP email and this type of encryption on my email, there's been one person <laughs> who's ever sent anything back to me encrypted, and Facebook. If you give Facebook your public key, it'll actually encrypt all its email to you. It's not, you know, I'm listening here, ProtonMail hopefully changes this because it's so easy. But setting up, you, you know, if you use an S-MIME certificate, you have to go out and get it just like you would an SSL certificate. PGP you can generate, but these aren't the simplest things in many cases to set up. PGP, by the way, stands for pretty good privacy. And it's a prede predecessor of most of these modern tools. So a lot of these public keys and that are coming back to the PGP project and most of what we use for whether it be iOS communications or things like that. There's uh, GPG, which you'll often see, which is GNU Privacy Guard. And on Mac, gpgtools.org is a simple application that if you use Mac Mail, will take care of all of this for you. It's almost as easy as ProtonMail. I use Gmail and I put GPG tools on my computer, and it's done. Now I can do encryption, and I can do signing all with one app very quickly. On Windows, there's gnupg.org. Keybase.io can do this type of thing. It's, it's, it's really, the hard part of this is you have to install the extra app and follow its setup instructions. On Mac, it's easy enough that you set it up, it'll, you install it, you tell it to generate a certificate, it'll walk you through all that, and you use your email. And on the email, you got encrypt, sign, done. That's all you have to worry about with it. If somebody sends you something encrypted, you might not even know it because it'll just pop up and it'll show up. But if you go back to your, G, you know, if you go to gmail.com and try to read it, you can't. 
because now everything's encrypted on your computer. So the, this program's doing it. That's probably the only way you'll know you have an encrypted message is when you try to open it someplace else because it's really transparent. And that's, I've actually stayed with Mac Mail as my email application over Outlook or anything else simply because this really is easier, at least in my experience. On Windows or Mac, there's Thunderbird email client or Postbox, which is kind of a derivative of Thunderbird. Thunderbird is, for all practical purposes, Firefox's attempt at one point of an email client. And Postbox builds off of that. And then they have something called Enigma, which is you know, just like you install a Chrome add-on or a Firefox extension. It's simply an extension for uh, Postbox or Thunderbird that adds that encryption to either one of those. And just like Mac P GP or GPG tools or Mac on Mac Mail, you just once that's installed, you can just continue to use it. So it's not hard to do, but in order to do this on your email, you have to install something else. Is really what this comes down to. When you install that, it does generate a key. So you want to make sure you back that key up. So it, it'll tell you, you know, you can get, export your keys and things like that. Use, that's where you want to use something like LastPass or 1Password. Put it in there so it's not just sitting on your hard drive. And then when you're, inevitably you replace a computer or whatever, you can go back into 1Password and still get the data back. If you lose that key otherwise, and you have six years worth of encrypted data or encrypted emails, and you lose your key, to, your access to all that email, the key's gone, you don't have that email anymore, it's gone. There's, you're not getting that back. So that's, that's the most dangerous part about this. But the setup of it is fairly easy. And saying that, and like I say, in 10 years, I, I can think of one person in 10 years who's ever sent me an encrypted email. I teach this stuff. I work with people who teach this stuff. And still, not many people use it. There are other email clients and solutions out there. There's ways, there, you know, Gmail came out with an, a native extension for it about two years ago. I think it's still in beta. Uh, it, Gmail doesn't have a whole lot of incentive to encrypt the email it wants to read to give you ads. But <laughs> there's, all, there's all kinds of other solutions. Uh, Outlook has various things built into it, as well as extensions, uh, mail enables, uh, all these other applications that you could use. Most have something. The level of difficulty to set them up can vary greatly. But if you do want to encrypt or sign or verify email, if you're a Mac user, GPG tools is super easy. And then getting into GNU PG or just even Outlook on PC makes it pretty simple for you too. There are iOS and Android apps that can work with this as well. They get weird because you always wind up cutting and pasting between like your native map and then you got to paste it into a special keyboard and things like that. But it is also available on Android and iOS. It's just a little more difficult to use. So that's email. And then there's another problem with this, which is private browsing, whether it be oftentimes in WordPress, this becomes this, this, this part of the talk has gotten real popular around SEO people and MLM mar marketing type things and stuff like that. And how do you keep your browsing private, especially in places like uh, Starbucks or where you're sitting in an open room or something like that? Of course, the first thing is staying anonymous. One big thing I do recommend, and I have one in here, privacy screen. This is magnetic. It sticks. You can get them. I think this is about 30 bucks on Amazon. It sticks to my Mac and then anything other than direct on view, you can't see my screen anymore. I don't list that on here because it's not as practical for everybody. It's, it's, it's an accessibility nightmare. If you can't see very well, you can't. They make the screen very difficult to read, but it's a very good thing to add. And then there's things that we hear about all the time. Turning off cookies, turning off JavaScript using an ad blocker or something like EFF Privacy Badger. Use DuckDuckGo for search. Has anybody in here ever looked at Google's dashboard and their, your own search history? If you have an Android phone especially. If you have iOS, you're probably, especially if you use Google, you're still going to get the search history. But if you have an Android phone, go into www.google.com slash dashboard and look at the history it has on you. Everything you've ever searched, if you use Chrome, every site you've ever visited, every place you've ever lived, and it'll tell you if you've walked or drive to it, or if you've flown to it. The amount of data this keeps on you. DuckDuckGo is an alternative that you can search back into Google, and you can turn those off in Google, and there's ways to make that a little bit better. But DuckDuckGo avoids that entirely, and it's, a simp it's simply an alternative search engine that doesn't track you. I found its results in some cases better, in some cases about even. So it's kind of a 50-50, but it does help. 
You can really take this to another next level by using something called Tor. When you hear about the dark web and the Silk Road and all this type of thing, where they really want to be private, Tor browser, the idea is it's a separate, it's a specialized version of Firefox that if, if used correctly, it can keep you almost completely anonymous. So that, that's going to help. You know, that, like I said, that's more of a marketing type thing. It's not always part of your own personal threat model, but it is considerations to make. And there's a few other issues, of course, we have to consider with this as well. Encryption, of course, is to protect your users first. That's something I, I, I can't stress enough. I, most people don't care what their own data is. I have a backup, I have this, I have that. We're worried about the privacy in, uh, entrusted to us by, by our users. Encryption doesn't start, stop malware hacking or protect from vulnerabilities. So if you have an outdated version of WordPress, you know, you have an ancient version of MailPoet, you're still going to get hacked with that ancient version of MailPoet. Sorry if there's any MailPoet developers in here. The current version's completely safe. It was just a popular hack way back in the day. The biggest one of all is encryption is limited by consistent use. This is what makes encryption so hard for most people. This is why just about every time you see uh, movies or I shouldn't say movies, just general news these days about people who are uncovered as they try to do secret things, nine times out of ten it's, they, it's inconsistent use. Maybe they reuse their username, you know, they're using a username on the dark web, the Silk Road, whatever it might be, and then they go ahead and they sign into Reddit with that same username. Or they use a VPN and 90% of the time, and then they go to Starbucks one day and forget to turn the VPN on. Or their computer, you know, well, you have, you have a spreadsheet with uh, social security numbers in it. You lock it down every time you leave the computer. You leave the screen up at Starbucks, you walk away, and it's still on the screen. Consistent use of this stuff is the hardest part of it. Just like any, you know, anything else when we talk about safety, all it takes is one miss, and it can get you back in trouble. So things like encrypt.me, particularly with the VPN, are, that's why I find it so valuable, because it's automatic and it makes it so much easier. It's actually nice on iOS because if you have the VPN sign up on top, you know the, the Wi-Fi you're connected to actually works. So it's a nice little detection if that Wi-Fi is actually any good or if you're on some garbage Wi-Fi where you can't get any data through. So a couple other resources to check out if you want to go further with this. Uh, a good one is tosni.com. They do, uh, for instance, they have a solution if you use Gravity Forms that'll fully encrypt uh, data on the back end. So if somebody sends you important data on gravity forms, you can save it on the back in an encrypted database, separate from your WordPress database. Bruce Schneier is an expert on uh, privacy and security. HPE, which is actually uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise's security blog is excellent. The Electronic Found Frontier Foundation deals a lot with privacy and things such as digital privacy, how to maintain the best practices, things like that. Wired's Threat Level and Brian Kebs are two other very good blogs on this type of thing. All of these are resources that I, I love giving this talk, but what I give today, you know, I re, I, every time I give this talk, I reduce some slides because something's changed every time. This stuff moves very quickly. The regulatory environment around it right now moves very quickly. So keeping up on these types of blogs is probably your best bet to stay current, learn of new tools, et cetera.